ordinary objects of everyday life. We use them, take them for granted, hardly even notice them in our daily routine. But when planes become weapons and buildings become graves, when almost 3,000 people are murdered on a clear September morning, we cling and grasp for meaning in the debris left behind. We all know the story. But we can't know all the stories of September 11th. At the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, a collection of objects keeps alive many first-hand accounts. The Smithsonian is the nation's memory. Memory is uh, what defines us as human beings. When a society loses its memory, uh, it's catastrophic, uh, uh, I believe, in terms of what holds us together. I assumed I would always remember it, so why write it down? And I just never got around to it. What I'm fearful of is that uh, we tend to forget. For anyone touched by the tragedy of September 11, 2001, it seems absurd that we could ever forget the events of that day and how they changed America. But memories, even these memories, can fade with time. We all uh, came to work the day after 9-11 and started thinking about, about what we should be doing. We felt that it required an extraordinary response on our part. It's not something that museum professionals are used to doing. They're used to collecting good stories on um, what's right with America, celebrating um, things of the past. We generally don't do these traumatic events. But September 11th changed all that. Congress designated the museum the official repository of artifacts related to the tragedy. When you see these, these pieces, they represent a moment of life that someone carried. Whether it is a piece of the plane, whether it is a bunker coat, it is a, a camera. You've donated that piece of history and it's, it's no longer a museum. It's more like it's a home that has something of you that will be there forever. I think to paraphrase, We'll never forget. And I think that, you know, if, if, if we can do anything with this collection, that's what we can do. We can help people remember. It was like any other morning. It was a beautiful day. I actually got in early that day because we have monthly meetings and I happened to be running that one, so I was in early, just sitting at my desk. Lisa Leffler worked for AON Risk Services in the World Trade Center's South Tower. A few blocks away, Firehouse Engine 7, Ladder 1, was responding to a call about a suspected gas leak. In the morning of 9-11, uh, we were at a, a gas leak that was about a dozen blocks from the World Trade Center. And um, it, it was just a routine emergency. And then we heard the plane come overhead. Chief Pfeiffer was accompanied by French documentary filmmaker Jules Naudé. Planes fly low in, in New York City all the time, but this one was Something grabbed their attention. It was simply too loud and, and too close. And I remember just looking up. I'm pointing the, the camera this way, and I see the uh, American airline plane. It was that close that I could see the, the logo on, the, uh, on its um, uh, the tail fan. 
and disappears behind a building. And so I have time just to swing the camera around to see where, where it will reappear. And it reappears and hits directly the, um, the tower one. When you see a plane um, aim for a building, there was no doubt that this was a terrorist event. So all of us that were responding knew we were going to one of the largest fires of our lives and that thousands of people um, were in the greatest moment of need. Carrie Hunt lived just blocks from the towers. I had my back towards the window at the time when I heard a gigantic boom, a, like a thunderous boom, like it was, a, it sounded like a bomb. From her desk on the 103rd floor of the other tower, Lisa Leffler heard it too. And just heard this, heard this weird, weird noise um, sound below me. And so that was weird. I looked out my window because I happened to be right on the window. And I saw this fireball coming up. My husband, Noe, was asleep in bed. She sort of tried to wake me up and, and said, you know, I think something's going on. And I sort of, with one eye open, looked out the window and saw the papers flying. Not sure what they were witnessing, Noe, a fashion photographer, and Carrie, an art director, grabbed their cameras. I wasn't afraid yet. I knew that something was happening, and I felt, both of us felt like it was just our job at the time was to document it. Seeing the flames and thinking her tower was on fire, Lisa Leffler hurried to the elevator. I was with a friend of mine who was uh, a little bit nervous, and an elevator opened in front of us, so I pushed her in, got in after her, and we went down. And actually, I remember her saying, I forgot my purse. I said, don't worry about it, we'll be back up in half an hour, let's just figure out what's going on. Matthew Farley, a lawyer who worked on the 89th floor of the North Tower, or Tower One, was running late and saw the damage from the ground. I was counting the floors and I realized that the first plane came in four stories above us, um, which turned out to be uh, the deciding point as to who lived and who died for most people. As Matthew hurried towards the towers, he pulled out his Blackberry. Mobile phone circuits were overloaded that morning, but Blackberries worked. Frantically, he began checking on his colleagues. Inside the lobby of Tower One, Chief Pfeiffer set up a command station and started sending firefighters, including his brother, Kevin, upstairs to rescue people. As we went in the lobby, he came up and didn't say anything. We just looked at each other and would have, would have concern whether the other one was gonna be okay. And then I told him to go up to the 70th floor and to evacuate the people coming down. Robin Weiner's brother, Jeff, was also inside the building. I wasn't even sure which tower he was in and what floor, so we were trying to get information. We were just frantically all trying to make phone calls and figure out what was going on. United Airlines flight attendant, Kathy Stanchak, had the day off. She could see the World Trade Center from her home in New Jersey. I remember looking and seeing this billow of smoke and saying, wow, that's a lot of damage. And with that, I saw another airplane, a United airplane, coming down Hudson River the opposite way of it would ever come. And then at 9.03 that morning, we heard a, another loud roar of a plane coming. And this time it hit the, the, the South Tower. On the morning of September 11th, 2001, in a blink, everything had changed. You could hear the fire, you could hear people screaming. You could see 
things falling from the towers. We didn't know what that was. We now know that was it was people who were who were jumping. As Jules filmed in the lobby of the North Tower, the horror intensified. When the the people started jumping, it brought the the death that we knew already had happened on the, uh, on the floors during the uh, the the plane heading, but it brought it, it was immediate, you know. We could hear them, we could see the remains, and and as time goes by, you see in the in the eyes of the firefighters the, the concern. Not the fear, because they're they know they're going to go up there, but they realize that it's going to be one an incredibly long battle to fight. Meanwhile, Matthew Farley continued walking downtown, trying to track down his co-workers. They gotta find out where these people are. I've worked with them for 20 years. Solicitor General Theodore Olson was in his office at the Department of Justice in Washington, watching it on television until a phone call placed him in the crosshairs of history. My secretary came in and said that my wife, uh, my wife Barbara, was on the telephone. She had left that morning on American Airlines Flight 77 to fly to Los Angeles. And I was very relieved at first um, to hear she was on the phone and I picked up the phone. And she told me that her flight had been hijacked. Then, of course, my heart sunk. Come out, say Barbara Olson, a well-known political commentator, somehow managed to place a call from the doomed airplane. We spoke for uh, 40 or 50 seconds, I'm not sure, um, and then her phone was cut off. And then somehow, a few moments later, her call came in again. Barbara revealed details about the hijacker's methods. She had been sitting in first class, and she and the other passengers and the crew had been herded to the back of the airplane. She told me that they had used box cutters as weapons. At some point, I told her about the events in New York. I felt that I had to tell her that. And we exchanged words of I love you, and at some point, and the phone went dead. At the Pentagon, like everywhere else, staffers were riveted by news of the attacks in New York. For us already, it was pretty apparent these were terrorist attacks, and we were even um, presuming it was Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden and coming out of Afghanistan and already thinking about the impact for us in the Department of Defense, and then almost at that time, we felt a, a really violent, shuddering impact at the Pentagon. Jerry Henson was working at his desk at the time of the attack. Uh, the impact caused debris to fall on him, pin him at his desk. The outer extremity of the flight path there was probably 15 or 20 feet from, from where I sat. The room was rapidly filling up with uh, very noxious fumes. Jet fuel was, was burning uh, in a trail behind the, uh, the airplane. Fire was eating away at the World Trade Center as well. The towers were built to withstand a plane, and it did. What wasn't calculated by the engineers and the, the architects was the effect of fire. It never occurred to us, to any of us, that these towers could fall. It was just simply not, not possible. The tower 
towers collapsed and we saw this burst and this explosion, that's, that's probably when the first true reaction of fear came. The size of the building was so massive from our perspective that uh, when it started to fall, it actually felt like we were falling. It was sort of that literally free fall feeling, gut feeling. We took pictures as long as we could, which is probably about 10, 12 seconds uh, before we had to run because of the smoke and the debris. We ran into the stairwell and went back down to our apartment and it was pitch black, it was darker than night. Jules Naudet was filming Chief Pfeiffer in the lobby of the North Tower, Tower One, when the South Tower fell. I remember when, at that moment, we hear that very loud, loud roar, as if, you know, a freight train was coming at you 100 miles an hour. And you know it, it was bad news. And I, I was convinced I was about to die, so I sat down and said, okay, this is it, let's make my peace with it, and, you know, it, death is coming for me. And the rumble stops, you can't see anything. And then voices start, you know, are you okay, are you okay? Oh, we had no idea that a 110-story building just collapsed. As far as we were concerned, it's probably one floor pancaked into another. We thought that we were the only ones in trouble, that the elevators blew out or part of the plane crashed into the lobby. But we knew one thing. We knew we couldn't command any longer. So I got on the radio and I said, command to all units in Tower 1, evacuate the building. At the Pentagon, the crash cut a fiery swathe of devastation. Defense Protection Officer Isaac Hoopi was first on the scene. He ran inside the burning complex. Think of a dark room and things, you know, lights flickering, uh, water, the sprinklers going off, smoke coming from all over, you know, different angles. And besides feeling the heat, you know, you can hear people calling out. Isaac began pulling survivors from the rubble. When the smoke and the fire became so great, he got down on his knees and he used his voice to save lives. All I did during that time started calling out and said, hey, Antoine's my voice, come towards my voice, I'm over here. As Isaac pulled victims from the Pentagon, Captain Dave Thomas and Navy Dr. David Tarantino desperately searched for friends and co-workers deeper inside the building. The corridors themselves were literally full of the thickest, blackest smoke that you can imagine from ceiling to floor. And so people couldn't get their bearings. Uh, it seemed to me that the, uh, that the plane had left a trail of fuel that was being ignited uh, one right after another. Part of the wall had been blown out by the landing gear of an aircraft. And that's when I first knew for certain that a plane had flown into the building. I turned the corner, and there's a, a tire from an airplane. Didn't realize what it was, but a, a huge piece of a fuselage of an airplane and a tire and some chairs. Back in his office, Ted Olson hoped his phone would ring again. But on television, more breaking news. There was a picture of the Pentagon that came on the air with um, smoke coming up from the Pentagon. I was terrified that, in fact, I sort of in my heart knew that that was Barbara's plane. I knew that there wasn't any hope. I didn't want to leave that television set. I didn't want to leave the phone. Inside the crash site, conditions were deteriorating. The flames were so hot, it was melting parts of the ceiling and would drip and melt through your uniform. And I had taken my, my, uh, my shirt off and had it wrapped around my head because um, the, the conduit, the plastic that goes over wires is starting to heat up and, and drip down and, you know, sting and burn. You know, we thought there's no way anyone is alive in here. And then we kind of heard a, a noise, uh, kind of a weak noise off to the side. 
in the distance, I see the smoke, and in, in a little closer in the foreground, there's uh, this 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 shape. It looks like a head, and it, and as I'm staring at it, it it blinks. Jerry Henson was alive, but trapped by debris. And I'm pushing for all I'm worth, and I'm screaming as loud as I can. Someone help, help me. And now the whole structure is starting to groan and kind of creak and shriek, and, and you can sense that it's about to collapse, and people outside are yelling that the, the building's collapsing. But he was just wedged in there. There was just no way to get him out. Tarantino got on his back and put his feet against the, uh, the object. And, uh, and pushed it up maybe three or four inches, which was enough. We're both yelling, he's yelling, I can't hold this any longer, you know, get out of here, get, get out. And then Captain Thomas grabbed him and, and dragged him out. And it was literally in the nick of time because the, the, that space collapsed and caved in right behind us. San Francisco-bound United Airlines Flight 93 took off from Newark Airport on September 11th, just as it did every morning. 46 minutes into the flight, it was hijacked. Flight 93 was in air when the other three planes had crashed, and it became quite apparent to everybody on board what the fate of the plane was. One of those people was senior flight attendant Lorraine Bay. Lorraine Bay and I have been friends since 1972. Lorraine and I always flew together. And over the course of the years, you got closer and closer. From the plane, air phone and mobile phone calls enabled hostages to learn their fate and plan their strategy. And when one of those uh, telephone exchanges they said they decided to, uh, to form a, a resistance uh, in just a matter of minutes and actually did uh, try to uh, get into the cockpit and uh, alter the, uh, the plans uh, of the hijackers. After a struggle in the cockpit, the plane crashed into a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. If you're ever in an emergency on an airplane, you never think you're going to die. You always think that there is a way out of this, which is a better way to think about it than just, you know, caving in. So I, they fought to the last minute to live, to live. Inside the North Tower, firefighters still had no idea the South Tower was down and that theirs was about to go. When we were in the lobby, we didn't have all the information that, that you had in, um, watching TV. We didn't know what was taking place um, dozens of floors above. We finally come outside and well, we see our tower is completely intact. I don't register that I'm seeing giant steel beams on the floor. So we go outside and milling around for about five minutes until you know we hear that rumble again and it's literally coming down on top of us. And just had to have time to um, start running. You cannot, you couldn't see an inch in, in front of the glass. We can only hear the second one collapse. And that was actually even more frightening because we knew this time what was happening. I walked into Midtown and it wasn't until I was in about the 30s that I got cell phone service. So I called my husband and he goes, oh my God, I didn't know where you were when they fell. And I said, what? He said, they fell. I looked behind me and you, know, you just saw the black smoke and I'm like, oh my God. I had come in that, um, that building where it was a beautiful, 
blue sky, sunny day, and um, you know, I, I come out and it's like a nuclear winter. You have debris all over, you have uh, cars upside down, fires roaring all over the place, and, and that smell of death that was over the, that entire lower Manhattan. The first time we walked out of the building, it was the streets were empty and just full of ash and debris. And there was, you know, one lone fireman walking down Broadway by himself. He looked like a ghost. He looked like a walking ghost. And he had all his equipment on, but he was alone. The chief's order to evacuate the North Tower saved countless lives. It, it, it was a miracle that the first, um, first few units that arrived at the scene actually made it out. If you were a second slower or a, a foot to your right or your left, you didn't make it out. At the Pentagon, rescue efforts continued. Running towards that um, fire and um, the incident, everything was moving in slow motion. You know, you're thinking, oh, you know, this, this can't be. I mean, but everything that you train for usually kicks in. Jerry Henson made it out. But both Tarantino and Thomas were headed back into the building to look for survivors. Dave Thomas saw Tarantino's name tag and he reached over and, and ripped it off of his chest. I wanted to be able to tell this story if, if I made it and he didn't. And then he said to me, remember this guy, he's the one that saved you, Dave Tarantino. The Navy were taught honor, courage, and commitment and to not leave anyone behind. That's a military ethos that, that we take to heart. And so we were the ones on the scene and it was up to us to do it to do what we could. By now, news channels had begun broadcasting the aircraft's flight number, confirming Ted Olson's fears in the most public way. I think of all of the people that were killed that day, Barbara was maybe the best known to a large number of, of the American public because she had been on television so much as a commentator. And so her picture flashed up there with the dates of her birth, and in her case, 1955 to 2001, which is pretty shocking to see. Olson's office phone, Tarantino's name tag, Henson's suit, and Thomas and Hoopi's uniforms. Everyday objects that help us recall what happened at the Pentagon on September 11th. The name tag, Dave Tarantino's name tag, was very precious to me. And that was, that was tough to uh, surrender. But in the context of, uh, of history and in preserving the, the heroic deeds of that day, it made a lot of sense. So I was grateful in that context to give it to the Smithsonian. In New York, as the smoke and dust gradually settled, no one was sure if it was really over or what to expect. Iron worker Jimmy Connor was on the job at the Williamsburg Bridge between Brooklyn and Manhattan when the towers went down. A lot of people thought that the bridges were going to go next. People were worried about the Brooklyn Bridge, the Williamsburg Bridge, the Manhattan Bridge. And so we, we just realized that, you know, this, this is definitely a very big place to be. Jimmy and his crew hurried off the bridge and headed down to the ruined towers to pitch in. And got my tools and got my, most importantly, my respirator and walked to downtown Manhattan. Ground Zero, or the pile, as the first responders called it, was a 20-story tall heap of twisted steel. 
There was steel hanging overhead. There was parts of the facade um, that, that we remember standing up that was unsupported. There was voids that you could fall into. Um, underneath the, the pile, things had to be searched. In the beginning, the, the, the hope was that it was a rescue operation and that, that they could untangle the steel of the, of the trade towers and, and free people. The first day, we were working with five-gallon buckets. <laughs> At least you were trying to do something. But it was kind of like trying to excavate, you know, Mount Everest with a teaspoon. It soon became devastatingly clear that there were no survivors in the wreckage. But Robin Weiner and her family held out hope that her brother Jeff, an employee in Tower One, may have made it out. We were trying to find Jeff. We literally developed this master list of all the hospitals. We would divide into teams. And then we would just walk from hospital to hospital. I remember the walks. I mean. We did this on Wednesday and Thursday all day. Robin and her family put up posters, hoping to connect with someone who knew something. Also, there's a little note at the bottom. We asked if anyone, any family members, had any loved ones who were on that floor and survived to call us and let us know, because maybe they could tell us what had happened to Jeff. It's just amazing how crowded every possible surface <laughs> was becoming um, in the city at that point. They kept up the search until they heard the official word from Jeff's employer. On Friday afternoon, the head of Marsh had a meeting for all the families and um, announced at that point, basically, that there were no, there were essentially no survivors. It was confirmed that the 96th floor, Jeff's floor, was the first plane's point of impact. And that Friday was a tough day. Then we struggled with what do we do? There's no body. How do you, you have a, how do you have a funeral? You can't have a funeral. Do you have a memorial service? What do you do? Countless other families asked these same questions during the months that followed. With no survivors, the rescue effort turned into a delicate recovery operation. I don't even want to tell you what I saw down there. I don't even want to remember what I saw down there. I mean, you can just, you can just smell how bad it was, you know. There's miles and miles of, of wire that are, you know, burning. You can just smell the, you know, the insulation burning. You can smell... It's, it's all bad. It's all bad. On September 11th, Boyd Harden was one of the first volunteers on the scene. I remember walking by and, and looking at some of the artifacts on the ground and wondering if that was from the plane or from a building or what have you. And I, I walked into the Brooks Brothers building and it was completely silent and every bit of clothing in there was covered in ash. Everything was just so unbelievable. About a block away from the site, Boyd spotted something. I looked down and I saw a briefcase, a black leather briefcase with a, a strap that had been broken. And I opened it up and I found a wedding invitation, a train ticket, six resumes and a Pop-Tart wrapper. And I grabbed one of the resumes, and the woman's name was Lisa Leffler. Frankly, I was never expecting to see the briefcase again. We were on the 103rd floor. I sat at a window cubicle facing Jersey. Uh, the briefcase is just under my desk, you know, near my feet. And the next thing I knew, it was on Church Street and then to meet somebody who found it, found the courage to call, not knowing what he was gonna find on the other end of the phone. Megan, how are you? I'm good, how are you? 
Boyd returned the briefcase to Lisa. There's not a lot of personal items that were found by other people. There were no desks found. There were no file cabinets. Everything was destroyed. For me, it's nice because this kind of has a happy ending, and just about every other story doesn't. Right. I want to make sure that Future generations don't forget. There were real people here. They weren't just random, you know, whatever. There were real people with real lives and real families who got, who were lost. And if I can do a little bit to make sure they're remembered, I'm going to do that. Among the lost was Chief Pfeiffer's brother, Kevin. Last seen in the lobby of Tower One. When I gave the evacuation order to leave the building, this company stopped to direct other firefighters to a more safe stairwell. But that was what firefighters do. They think about other people. It's, it's often uh, asked to me, well, what is a hero? And my definition of a hero is those that do ordinary things, but in an extraordinary time. Clean up and recovery of the 16 acre field of destruction went on for months. On February 2nd, 2002, we recovered my brother. And uh, next to him, there was his officer's tool, which is about a, a foot-long uh, metal tool that's, that's used to, to force entry into, in, into buildings. And on 9-11, he carried that. And the tool, I could imagine, wasn't used to force entry, but was used to direct people. So that, that, that tool becomes a, a symbol of firefighters not worrying about themselves but worrying about other people. Jeff Weiner's family waited even longer. Two years after his memorial service, they finally had remains to bury, bringing Robin and her family closure and some consolation. He was killed instantly. Um, they could tell from the bone fragment that he was killed by the immediate impact of the plane, which as awful as it sounds, brings a certain amount of peace and comfort. Almost a decade after masterminding the September 11th attacks, Osama bin Laden was found and killed. History never stops, and stories of September 11th are still being told, often for the first time. As people come forward, the Smithsonian keeps collecting. In some cases, it's only now that as the 10th anniversary approaches that they remember and they um, open up that closet or they open up that drawer and they look in and they think, I, I can tell my story, I can pass it along. Jeff died without any children and he doesn't have a legacy in terms of children, but to know that he's here in some manner at the Smithsonian is in itself creates a legacy and that's that's pretty important to all of us in our family. People want to know, especially when they've had a tremendous loss, that that loss is seen as being important. That people didn't die for no reason. That even though it was caught them by surprise, it wasn't meaningless. And I think part of what we do is to remind people that these parts of history have meaning. They need to be understood. They're part of our national heritage. Harry and Noe, whose neighborhood was shattered beyond recognition, moved out of their apartment and away from Ground Zero. They haven't been back until today. After taking the pictures, um, 
we put them away. Um, we didn't show them around. I remember a rumbling sound right before. Well, I remember a cracking sound. A cracking. Like a pop. It's, you know, it's not something we really talk about that much, or we ever did, really. Even the day after, or a week after, or months after. Um, you know, you try to talk about it with someone, someone in your family, and it's, you just, you just can't really go there because they have absolutely no idea what, what the smells were like and the, the sounds were like. We were lucky. We weren't hurt. Our friends didn't die that day, and many people don't have that story. This one's hard to imagine. Loved one is attached. It was a story that Smithsonian photography curator Shannon Parrish needed to hear. You could see floors collapsing. She asked Carrie to show her the photos. After looking at them for a while, I said, you know, Carrie, there's something strangely quiet about these photographs. She didn't say anything. Then after a while, I asked her, what, what compelled you to take photographs? And she said to silence the screaming. I think that there were probably a lot of individuals who tried to take pictures because then you have a way of controlling the scene in front of you. Between the Pentagon, Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and the World Trade Center, more than 2,700 people were killed. In New York, that includes 343 firefighters. And that number doesn't reflect the numerous first responders impacted by conditions at Ground Zero. A lot of people are still dying from that attack. That's the, the sad part. In a way, 9-11 is still happening. Chief Joe Pfeiffer donated his gear as a remembrance for all the firefighters lost. These were, in fact, real people like you and me um, that lived lives like you and I did. So these objects that touch their lives then will touch you. And then you can appreciate the magnitude, uh, the enormity of what happened that day. It's very much about stories of survival, of being rescued, of losses. These were real people. I'm sorry that I can't bottle my earnestness. It makes a, a big difference to me that I'm the one who's making sure that these collections are safe for the future. To suddenly have the camera I was, I was using in the Smithsonian is a quite surreal uh, and incredibly uh, a proud uh, uh, moment because, you know, I, I became an American citizen because I, I, I love this country. Being part of the Smithsonian, you know, I, I'm, you know, honored, very honored. I was absolutely honored to do it. And um, at the same time, I, I felt funny about it because there were guys down there that did a hell of a lot more than I did, but it worked out how it worked out, you know. It was, a, uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. When Flight 93 crashed in the Pennsylvania countryside, the plane was destroyed and everyone on board was killed. Few intact objects were found. One of them was Lorraine Bay's flight manual, donated by her husband, Eric, and delivered by friend and fellow flight attendant, Kathy Stanchak. It was in a brown cardboard box, and I'm saying, do I want to open it now or do I not? And when I opened it, it was just, it just reeked of jet fuel. And I broke down then, I said, now, it's reality now. It's kind of like I'm holding history in my hand. Now, we didn't talk about the events much, but you knew everybody else had the same experience. 
Years later, as individuals that helped heal all of us, and as a nation, America is still coming to grips with September 11, 2001. As the decades pass, the objects at the Smithsonian will close the gap of time, keeping alive not just the horror, but the humanity of that day. History is, is happening right now. And it's everybody's story, individually and collectively. The enormity of September 11 threatens to swallow up the individual stories. But the fragments at the Smithsonian are a reminder of every victim, witness, and hero. This story belongs to all of us.